Imagine that you're at a formal fundraiser in New York City. You're dressed in your best clothes, surrounded by people with loads of money, and listening to politicians giving speeches about how great they are. Suddenly, you hear screaming from the balcony. You turn and see a man swinging from a rope, yelling about rights for homosexuals. People throughout the crowd begin standing as well, yelling about gay liberation and throwing sirens like hand grenades before handcuffing themselves to chairs. You've just been zapped. The ZAP was the method of activism preferred by the Gay Activist Alliance in the 1970s. The Gay Activist Alliance was at the forefront of gay liberation post Stonewall, having formed in 1969 after some members of the Gay Liberation Front wanted an organization that was exclusively dedicated to gay activism. I think the movement is very much uh, an attempt uh, by those of us who are openly and, and accepting, accepting of our homosexuality at getting people to uh, accept for themselves, get, getting gay people to accept themselves as uh, worthy and, and good human beings. The exclusivity of the GAA was problematic in some respects, mainly in that it didn't treat other minority issues as relevant to the gay cause. The organization formed because the Gay Liberation Front had allied itself with the Black Panther Party. Several members also saw transgender people as incompatible with the gay liberation movement. Ronald Gold, one of the leading members of the GAA, wrote an article titled No to the Notion of Transgender, in which he argued that being trans is a delusion that relies on gender stereotypes. Despite these inadequacies, the Gay Activists Alliance was a pioneer in the field of gay activism. They demanded complete freedom in every area and would accept nothing less than an immediate end to all oppression of homosexuals. Uh, we have a, a large and extensive political set of projects, passage of bills to repeal anti-homosexual laws uh, in the state legislature, a uh, number of bills up there including the repeal of the sodomy law, repeal of the cross-dress law, which makes it illegal to wear clothes of the opposite sex. Passage of a fair employment bill, which would make it illegal to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. The GAA's narrow focus allowed them to pour all of their energy into perfecting the technique of the ZAP. ZAPs were high-profile direct actions that embarrassed public officials and called attention to injustices against gay people. They were inspired by radical feminist agitprop of the 1960s, such as the invasion of the Miss America pageant in Atlantic City, when feminists brought freedom trash cans and threw away bras, high heels, Playboy magazines, and more. They also crowned a live sheep as the winner of the pageant. The most important aspect of the ZAP was its effectiveness at attracting the media. Historically, it had been difficult for activists to make headlines, and what press they were able to get was often very negative. But zapping was very good at getting the word gay into the mainstream press. Arthur Bell, a founding member of the GAA, describes the philosophy of the ZAP this way. Gays who have as yet no sense of gay pride see a ZAP on television or read about it in the press. First, they are vaguely disturbed at the demonstrators for rocking the boat. Eventually, when they see how the straight establishment responds, they feel anger. This anger gradually focuses on the heterosexual oppressors, and the gays develop a sense of class consciousness. And the no longer closeted gays realize that assimilation into the heterosexual mainstream is no answer. Gays must unite among themselves, organize their common resources for collective action, and resist. One of the most famous saps was the invasion of the New York City Clerk's Office, which featured prominently in Life Magazine's December issue of 1971. The Church of the Beloved Disciple, which had a majority gay congregation, had been performing services of holy union to symbolically affirm the love of same-sex couples. The public interpreted the ceremony as gay marriage, and the city clerk threatened to arrest the minister for officiating illegal unions. Of course, the GAA was not going to let this happen. Gay people have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Gay people have the right to their own bodies. Gay people have the right to love. No nation, state, or city has the right to deny gay people these inalienable rights. And no petty municipal clerk has the right to tell gay people how to live. They decided to take over the Marriage License Bureau on June 4th, 1971, and throw an engagement party for two gay couples, complete with a wedding cake. Give me a cake! Give me a A private office. Yeah. Well, um, we're just here to have an anniversary party. Maybe you yeah. didn't. But if you're trespassing on private property, you realize that. We should go to the other floors and out into the hall and get these invitations distributed. You're welcome to attend if you like. Free coffee, cake. Oh, this is definitely the marriage bureau, uh, but it's been taken over by the Gay Activist Alliance. The hypothetical zap that was stated at the beginning of this video is actually another real life example. 
the Radio Cities app. The GAA had had a long-standing vendetta against the mayor of New York City, John B. Lindsay, who refused to publicly oppose discrimination against homosexuals in employment, housing, and public accommodations. Other groups were critical of the GAA for targeting a liberal mayor as he appeared to be supportive behind closed doors. The GAA, however, would not stop until gay people were publicly recognized as a legitimate minority. Many zaps were launched against Mayor Lindsay, but none were quite as extraordinary as the Radio City zap, which took place during a 1972 fundraiser for Lindsay's campaign for the U.S. presidency. Rich Wendell, the newly appointed president of the GAA, scored Lindsay for campaigning on his strong civil rights record, saying, He's touring the nation, championing the rights of blacks, women, and Chicanos, which we applaud, but not one word about this country's 20 million homosexuals. Not one word about the oppression of 800,000 gay New Yorkers. As a result, the GAA decided to sabotage his campaign by infiltrating the fundraiser. They went in disguise and blended into the crowd until Lindsay took the stage. Lillian Faderman describes the events that followed in her book, The Gay Revolution. He'd barely opened his mouth before Morty Manford, stationed in the balcony where he'd affixed a sturdy rope, swung on it Errol Flynn style down to the orchestra, screaming, JUSTICE FOR HOMOSEXUALS! Cora Perota, a petite, vivacious Puerto Rican lesbian, veteran of many GAA zaps and used to being arrested for them, stood up from her seat in the orchestra and shouted, Why are you contributing to homosexual oppression, Mr. Mayor? She held up a siren that would sound an ear-splitting screech when the pin was pulled, and she pulled the pin. Then she threw the pin in the screech machine over the heads of the audience, as far as she could, and in opposite directions. She sat down again and handcuffed herself to the chair so that when the police arrived, there'd be an extra stir because they'd have to cut the handcuffs. The rest of the GAA members stood up one after another, yelling their slogans and throwing the sirens before handcuffing themselves to their chairs. This effectively canceled the fundraiser. The next day, Mayor Lindsay signed an executive order stating that city employees and applicants for city jobs could no longer be discriminated against for their sexual orientation. Despite getting unprecedented media coverage for gay rights and occasionally enjoying immediate payoffs such as the executive order, the GAA's tactics were controversial. They operated within the political system, which drew critique from socialist groups, but at the same time they were too revolutionary for the more conservative, assimilationist groups. When a gay rights bill failed in January 1972, even the group's biggest supporters blamed the GAA for its defeat, citing their obnoxious behavior at a series of public hearings. According to Out for Good, a book about the fight for equal rights, activists had screamed at council members from the front rows while men in drag ran in and out of the women's restroom. On the other hand, less raucous methods of protests had rarely made any strides in the past. Regardless of individual opinion on spectacle tactics, the Gay Activist Alliance had a lasting impact on future strategies. Most notably, direct action group ACT UP, which formed in 1987 in response to the AIDS epidemic, employed zap-like tactics such as the die-in on Wall Street, where 250 people protested the price gouging of HIV treatments by lying on the ground and pretending to be dead. Queer Nation, which formed in 1990, took this militant activism even farther by staging events like kiss-ins and reclaiming the word Queer. In conclusion, the Gay Activist Alliance was a revolutionary organization that changed the face of gay liberation for decades to come. The practice of zapping certainly wasn't perfect, but it held public officials accountable, brought media attention to the cause, and inspired gay youth to fight for their rights. Any comment? I just hope they're very happy. Right on. <laughs>